The 100% Wild Podcast is brought to you by Onyx Hunt, the nation's number one GPS hunting app. Download today in the Google Play and App Store. What's up, hunting junkies, and welcome back to the Drew Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. I'm one of the co-hosts, Tim Chelsvik. I'm the other, Matt Drury. We got a special guest in studio today. We got old man winner, Terry Drury. Yo, daddy. Yo, daddy. So that's special. Well, <laughs> we're scraping the bottom. <laughs> scraping the bottom of that barrel. We had so many people back out, and we kind of in, happened to be in studio, so we figured... <laughs> He's Terry on the provisional, provisional list. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not second rate, but somewhere... But you're available. Available. So we'll, there you go. <laughs> we'll take you. That's right. We get questions about where's Terry. I've seen that come through before. Like, why doesn't Terry get on more? Well, the real answer is Terry doesn't live anywhere near the studio. <laughs> no. <laughs> so yeah. But, and this evening, when the traffic is really, really prime, it's probably going to take me about two hours to get home from here. Something yeah, like that. I hour and forty-five. Don't. Uh, yeah, I don't envy you. I mean, you're in the same. We're all. We're both in the same boat. None of us lives wise. very close. Yeah. yeah. But Terry also did us a favor by wearing his Onyx shirt today the show is proudly brought to you by onyx that's right which i just used uh, my onyx app this past weekend out at the farm putting up trail cam or checking trail cams and moving them around putting those putting those waypoints in and i don't know about you guys but i get in a foul mood when i don't have a good deer to chase and that's kind of the situation i'm in right now yeah i'd say that's Basically every year at the at this time you seem to especially on your farm you usually don't have good early season picks they're on neighboring farms big ag country up there um, but this year it might be a whole different reason why you don't have very good pictures yeah al- although this morning I was looking at some cards and some cards I had pulled you know a week and a half or so ago I hadn't looked at them yet and I looked at them this morning and found two shooters on one field. Uh, that if they're still alive, then we at least got something to something to chase after. How many dead deer are you guys up to on your place? I think he's up to 17 that we've found on my farm thus far. Jeez. And a lot of them are, are, you know, many of them we've made visual contact, but some of them are an odor. We know they're there and just can't find them. The weeds right now are six foot, seven foot tall over your head. So it's pretty tough. He had to take the drone up the other day to find some of them out in – uh, standing cornfields and some bean fields and what have you. Yeah, so you know, in a scenario like that, it's as of today, it's September fourth. There's still a lot of time for deer to die if they're already dying between now and the first frost, which typically will help kill the midge, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, it, they will continue dying. So the the problem has really just begun, in all honesty, for a lot of areas, and it seems to be pretty universal. You know, the Midwest, we're getting every time you look at your phone, there's another text message from somebody saying, hey, you guys finding any dead deer? Yes, the answer is yes. We're here in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri. It's just pretty widespread right now, and, and really all over the states. It's not just, you know, little bitty pockets here and there. It seems to be pretty universal. Well, it- I guess yes and no, you know, so like northern Missouri, it's pretty prevalent. Mm -hmm. Northeast. Northeast northeast right now. Mm -hmm. But for instance, you know, we're, you know, mid-east here near St. Louis. And and it's not, I mean, I haven't heard of any of that in this area. Um, Sean, your brother-in-law, my son-in-law, he just sent me a picture of a dead deer that he found today. South? Mm -hmm. Down on their farm? Yes, south of St. Louis, sure enough. Huh. So... It's, uh, you know, it may have not hit some areas just yet, but it might might still be in the making. Terry, on your properties, are you finding that these deer meet a certain age class, or are they, are they more bucks or does, or is it just non-discriminate? Non-discriminate, all the above. Uh, although, I think a lot of those mature deer are off of me. They usually are. They're out in those big destination feed fields, oftentimes during the summer months. And then once the crops are cut, you know, beans are cut and, and the uh, corn is shelled, then they usually pile in for the acorn crop, the mass crop. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I'm fearful that once they start, you know, taking crops out, which they were later getting them in this year, so they're going to be later getting them out. But I'm afraid of what, what we're going to find in some of those big destination feed fields to the south of us there. Mm-hmm. 
It'll be interesting to see what the different departments of conservation or DNRs do if there is if the, the kill trend continues, if they'll look at doing something different with permits and the number of permits that they release next you year. You think they'd be able to react that quickly, though? I mean, typically, it doesn't seem to be, not a knock on them, but it doesn't seem to typically be a very fast reaction. So it'd be a next season type of a thing, yeah. certainly. I don't think you would see a change this year. I think that legislation takes about three years, if I'm not mistaken taken to change something like as important as bag limits unless mm -hmm. there's another means that they can go through an emergency but yeah. uh, I think it takes some time to get through all of the protocol yeah it kind of makes you wonder what what hunters should do you know legislation aside if if there is a big kill what sh what should they do on their property to kind of <laughs> blunt that effect I think ultimately that's where hunters you know become gamekeepers and, yeah you yeah. gotta you know what you're heard looks like and if all of a sudden you're not seeing the deer density that you were seeing i think you gotta lay off you know you know you might cull certainly if there's an old mature one but who knows mm -hmm. if most of your deer are dead you may not want to shoot anything right. you want yeah. to you know keep mating and, and try to grow the herd back from scratch almost and before we started the show you were talking terry that it may not be all ehd you suspect there might be some blue tongue mixed in there well i wish i knew that you know and someone smarter than i obviously will have to make those assessments but uh, i had a neighbor that said he had four cows last year that uh, died from blue tongue and i found that interesting i just heard this like two days ago and then uh, this morning i was talking to someone and he said his neighbor found a dead bull out in the field, and, and he didn't know what it died of. He thought it might have been blue tongue. So I'm wondering if there isn't some type of uh, maybe some mistaken identity here as far as what, what diseases we're actually dealing with. You know, some guys that have to start pulling the liver. And I think they made some positive ID with EHD on several. Several of the conservation departments have yeah. done that. But I wonder if it's all EHD-related, 100%, you know. Mm. Yeah. Time will tell. And if you do find a, a dead deer on your property, you really ought to call the, the conservation department in your area just so they can kind of update their numbers and, and see what all areas it's hitting. I know that Mark texted you and I a couple of days ago about an area in Iowa that was like a 12 by 12 mile radius where the conservation department thinks it's like a 95 to 100% oh die off. Gosh. Yeah, it's catastrophic. You know, <clears throat> same thing happened really in Fulton County, Illinois last year. If you recall, they got they got hit in 17 and they got hit in 18. It was just not good. I mean, they were non-existent. It literally yeah. eradicated the entire herd. And then for found a bunch we that we suspected that as we were yes. hunting there because we weren't seeing there anything nothing there yeah. on a really good track and uh and then in shed season he found several he found, dead. i think he found that like, was 16 wasn't it no that was last this past spring yeah that was this past spring he yeah, found no, that's them, what so i'm saying 18 and 17 17 i'm 18. talking about the amount of deer he found he found 10 bucks in like an hour and a half. Yeah. But oh yes, with does and everything, 18 or yeah. 18 or 19 deer in a pretty short order in a yeah. pretty small area as well. So, so you you were talking about you know how many and where at and all that. We've been using on X to actually mark waypoints on our farm to say, okay, we found this one here, that one there, this one here. So that this spring when we go shed hunting, we've already made a positive ID. We know where they're at. You don't want to count them again it's a good twice. Idea. But yeah, we're, yeah. we're marking them all on Onyx so we know exactly how many there are and where they are, where did they're you, located. Did you guys see that they added a Sasquatch waypoint? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so if I haven't you have seen a, him. If you have a Sasquatch sighting, it, they make it super simple to We, we may have to change waypoint. professions and get into the Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you may have more action. Somebody's yeah. really going to wonder if we see it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, someone on DeerCast, a user today, posted... Uh, a po it was a tongue in cheek post, but it, it was it said it helped me age the Sasquatch, <laughs> and I was like, I gotta see what this what this is. And I published it. It's in the fan share feed on Deercast. I don't know how he got this picture where it came from. It's a trail cam picture of what looks to be a chimpanzee scratching its back against a sapling. Oh wow, wow! <laughs> and <laughs> just maybe it's a zoo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looks like it came from the actual trail cam. Huh. So I, I mean, you can you can spoof that. You can just you know take the 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 little label off the the brand name and all the metadata and stuff off. And, but I don't know, I don't know where Weird. where he got it or what he did with. It, but we've got a Sasquatch sighting in there. You go. 
And you can mark it on Onyx. <laughs> there you go. Tim always lightens the mood. We were talking death and destruction here. And, and Tim brings us back. That's right. <laughs> so what do we got on tap today? Uh, so we have a, a conversation on missing time. <laughs> You got to basically on being abduct, <laughs> abducted, right? Alien abductions. That, that's the catch here. If, if people have listened to this show for any length of time, you mentioned it's probably been 10 or more shows back. We need to find it and link to it so people yeah, can listen to I'll, it. I'll make sure to do that yeah. in the notes. But you mentioned an experience that your dad and Coondog had about literally missing time. So I, I won't... Terry, you can tell the story, but... <laughs> This this is kind it's of a, a departure. One. It's a departure from, from this is kind of getting into the paranormal world as opposed Th- to that, deer hunting. That may have to be our future if all these deer keep dying. We may have to go to the Sasquatch <laughs> paranormal activity, you UFO know. sightings. Yeah. We get the UFO we get sighting waypoint. So what do we got here? Turkey season. How many years ago? It it had to be fifteen. Yeah, yeah. maybe longer. We were up at uh, Northern Missouri, and it was maybe. 4, 4 15 in the morning, something like that. We were going to another spot. You know, we'd left the, we called it the birdhouse back in the day. And, you know, we'd had breakfast, had our coffee. We had coffee that, to go. We took them with us. I was driving. Coondog was with me and pitch black, obviously, uh, heading, to, heading to a turkey spot. And we went from point A to point B. And I don't remember the exact distance that we covered. But I want to say it was maybe a half to three quarters of a mile. It was more than a quarter, you know, like a half or three quarters. I could go to the spot today and show you exactly where it took place. But we did that like that instantaneously. And at the time, we weren't sure what happened. Coondog looked at me and I looked at him and he said, what just happened there? And I said, I have no clue. I don't know. And we never said a word about that to anybody for well over a year. It might have been two years, year and a half. But we kept it mum's the word because we didn't think anybody would believe us. And we didn't talk about it. We never mentioned it. We just kind of went on about our merry way and never said a word to anybody about it. But it actually happened. Swear on a stack of Bibles. Swear on many, many lives that are close to me that we went from point A to point B in an instantaneous second. And... I'm still not sure what happened. Nobody's ever explained it that has, that we've mentioned it to, mm-hmm. but we said that they they checked us out and then they spit us out and said we don't want these two. They're when you bad say they, Jace, you mean aliens. aliens? Well, the Martians, yeah. Duh, duh. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I really don't. But if it was someone, some paranormal being, I don't know. They they looked at us two and said we don't want these this two. This can't bad, be the bad, best of the best. <laughs> these guys are on their last leg. We better bad sample. Them, turn them loose. Bad sample. It, it's interesting because missing time is a hallmark of the UFO abduction experience. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, people people will and and, and this has happened. The, there's a, a famous case of Barney and Betty Hill back in the late fifties or early sixties. I think out in Vermont they were traveling. They were on like a countryside vacation and they were missing something like four hours, like a trip that normally takes two hours, took them four hours and they could not remember except through hypnotic regression. And then they, then they kind of went back and they both, they both, both of them gave their stories independently and they both recall this, this light in the sky and then ultimately the light coming down in the road in front of them, stopping them and then being abducted, taken on board the ship. And, you know, I'm not saying this is true. This is just their story. But the missing time phenomenon is always part of these UFO abduction experiences. Terry? Well, we don't remember any of that. (laughs) But I do know 100%, 110% certainty that we went from here to there like that. And the clock, you know, we didn't see anything weird with the clock on the in the truck or our watches or anything. We both had coffee. We were stone sober. Mm-hmm. We, we were, you know, for those wide awake. For those of you <laughs> that wondering? know I mean, them <laughs> during turkey We were season. very alert, you know, but we were going to our turkey spot. And it happened so quickly, we neither one knew what happened. And we were trying to figure it out at the time. And we just chalked it up to we must have blinked. We must have, you know, dozed off. We didn't know what it was. Yeah. And then never said a word to anybody for a year and a half, something like that. And for those who don't know, Coondog, he's a retired 
police officer. Yes, so, municipal police officer. Yeah, so he's a trained, indiv- a serious individual, relatively speaking, <laughs> a trained observer, and someone that you would, you know, you would put some stock in. I guess he's very observant. <laughs> well, and and he we we knew at the exact moment that we neither neither one Something knew what happened because he turned to me and I turned to him and he goes, "What just happened there?" And I said, "I have no idea. I don't know. I didn't know." That's weird. still don't know. Nobody's been able to tell me what happened. Well, and and, and your your case is a little different in that you I guess aren't really missing time because the clock didn't change. You just almost like skipped ahead. We skipped ahead. And we were in a vehicle that went from here to there, like we went a mile or whatever it was. I didn't measure it, but we went a long ways like that, the whole vehicle no. and everything. We, <laughs> we were here, and then we were there going, how did we get here? That's it, what we did. How did we get here? If you ever have ridden with Terry, sometimes <laughs> you feel that way anyways. <laughs> like, how did we just get from here to there so quickly? <laughs> You're a fast speed. driver, Terry. <laughs> Some days. Yeah. Light you, speed. Used to used to really be. It's, so I don't know. It's a weird story. It's one that we often poke fun at at Turkey Camp amongst <laughs> the group. What really happened? Yeah. Was it foggy or was it clear? Mm-hmm. It was crystal clear. Okay. Crystal clear that morning. Because I heard a story of some people out in California that had a case of it was missing time. It was another like four hour chunk, but they drove into and out of a fog. And by the time they got out mm. of the fog, they'd missed a bunch of time. Hmm. You have a you have a unique case. It was pretty unique. Tim ha- knows a lot about this topic. I'm impressed. Well, and, and I mentioned this in the 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 podcast a few episodes ago that I saw a UFO when I was a kid. And the first thing I did after seeing it was run inside the house and check the clocks to make sure that I didn't get abducted and had been <laughs> gone for six hours. And because if if you've seen Flight of the Navigator, the old Disney movie, the kid was abducted I've seen that, yeah. for years, but to him it was just like a matter of a few days. Yeah. So you were thinking, I just... Maybe I just had a great adventure and didn't know it. <laughs> and some people say that something happened to them, and they know they could go through hypnotic regression and figure out what happened, but they just don't want to because they're afraid it would be too traumatic. Yeah, let's just leave... Bygones be bygones. Yeah, let's just leave it alone. <laughs> Ours well, didn't make us a better deer hunter or a better turkey hunter. So <laughs> it didn't I don't, give you superhuman no. ability. Didn't make you faster, ability. didn't make no. you better looking, no. just spit you None out a little above. more gray. Spit us out and said, we don't want these two. Bad sample. Yeah. Can you blame them? No, no I don't blame them at all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys want to move back to a deer hunting sure. related topic? I think we could Something end it right that there. people would really be interested in. I yeah, think yeah, that's it. Let's no, go I that think route. that was it. <laughs> We got our buddy Scott from West Texas that has a question for us about early season hunting. All right. The question of the day is brought to you by the new Lacrosse Navigator Series. Over 100 years of expertise culminates in these new lace-up boots that are 100% waterproof and 100% ready to go farther and hunt longer. Hey, my name is Scott. I'm from Keller, Texas. I'm out right now uh, bow hunting in uh, West Texas, and it is 90 degrees outside. How do you keep your scent under control with shifting wind and it being this hot and perspiring just because of the heat? I'd like to know. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Scott, for the question. And just for clarity's sake, uh, Scott, you've already introduced yourself. Just for clarity's sake, uh, Scott sent this message to us last year. I'm not sure when Texas bow season opens, but... Probably not yet. <laughs> yeah, so he's not actually. I, I may be already because Texas is, seems like it's always open some season. They're so friendly to hunters in Texas. It seems like yeah, based on some other states. Yes. So, so. what? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's that's hot. I mean, we we experience that a little bit in the early season in September in Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, but. That's pretty hot to be out there. Well, and those guys that, you know, hunt many of those southern states, Florida, Alabama. That's what they're know, always used to. Yeah. They, they've they got Georgia. They've got temperatures to deal with sometimes year-round, you know. Mm-hmm. But, man, I'll tell you, we, we go through extra effort early season because if it gets much above 82, 84, it's uncomfortable, 85, 87. So we shower two and three times a day, change clothes or wash them Every single time we go out, spray down, use the, you know, use the scent proof uh, shampoo, all the scent crusher products. 
Uh, make sure that we use a scent, scent crusher closet. Make sure everything's in there. Uh, we go through probably 20 to 30 minutes each and every application with the closet. And then in-field ozone generator, trying to do the best you can. But staying clean is a lot of it. And we do that with, with the Nomad products. We use as much early season light garments as we possibly mm -hmm. can. Sometimes going short sleeve, you know, with the really, really light pants yeah and uh, do the best you can try and think about shady spots one things that one of the things that we learned many years ago and and texas is one of these applications where you may or may not have trees you know where, that put off shade but those deer in on those warm days will always feed out in those shady areas if they come out in a sunny spot they'll run right to that shady mm. spot so uh, we try to hunt that sun or shady side of the field you know, depending on where, where it's at and what yeah. wind direction you have. But we try to stick to those shady spots as best we can. Now, in Texas, you may not be able to do that. Obviously, the, you know, the understory is only so tall. So uh, you may not have that application to where it would apply there. But I try to shower two, three times a day, keep our clothes scent, scent free. Mm -hmm. All of those products, we, we go through the nth degree early yeah. season. And it can be a full 10 degrees cooler in the shade than in the sun. Oh, yeah. And that, by and that all makes means. a difference, not only where the deer are, but where your stand the, location is. You, it's funny to, you know, they dad told me about this years ago, and it's funny to watch them because they will, <laughs> literally, as the shade moves, they're kind of moving yes. with it. Makes yes. sense. Yeah, it they're makes perfect Yeah, they dumb. got a fur coat on, so it mm -hmm. makes perf perfect sense, really. Yeah. But, and oftentimes, if they come out in that sunny spot, they'll run to get to the shade, you know, mm -hmm. and then they'll stand there and eat until the sun goes down. Yeah. So it, it's more often than not when it's warm like that, particularly in the Midwest. Texas and some of those southern states might be a little bit different. I think one of the hardest things is just getting to your stand and avoiding and sweating. sweating. Yeah. And there's like, I'm sure I've left some pretty wacky trail cam pictures <laughs> walking to my stand without a shirt on. Yeah. Just to keep, just to try to stay as cool as possible. Yeah, that's where, and, and in today's age, the, the garments, they make some really pretty nice stuff that's real lightweight mm -hmm. you know that you, you like you said a short sleeve t-shirt and you, you're pretty much set for the the whole evening right so yeah. just it's it's nearly impossible to get to your stand if you got any length of, of distance to walk without breaking a sweat in the early well, and season and then climb up and get all yeah. your gear yeah. collected and then sit down and you're you're wringing wet yeah, yeah. You broke, broke a sweat I, I usually and this is just something that i do i don't know but i usually try to either keep my hat off because it seems like if I keep yeah. my oh, hat yeah. on, it holds heat it, in. yeah, man, and it burns me up. So I usually mm -hmm. are, once I climb up the tree, it's the first thing I take off and just set on a limb oh, sure. <laughs> just till I get all my stuff situated because you're just burning up, man. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of guys will take like those scent wipes and oh, and yeah. wipe down yes. in the stand are like the scent crusher's got that spray that's pretty awesome, that copper spray. Mm -hmm. Spray down with that once you get in there. It's one more thing to carry, I know, but that's, you know, that's, I... I Definitely done that before, especially in the real hot days. Well, and all of those little bitty things add up. You know, that's yeah. that's the key. Early season is tough enough, especially with the way Scott described it, with shifting winds. So all of those little bitty things that you go through to the nth degree, you know, it only takes one time for it to work and, and makes a believer out of you. And if you're sitting in a, in a box blind... <sighs> No, I, I struggle with that. I can't. I, it's so hot. 140 degrees, 150 hot. Oh degrees. Gosh. I just can't. Miserable hot. It's, they're pretty miserable. Early season. Yeah. But you can, you know, if you get the, you know, know what the wind's doing, crack a window, and, mm -hmm. and that makes a huge difference. It does. Even cracking a window makes a huge sure. difference. Have you ever seen those little bitty things that are advertised now? They're supposed to be like little air conditioners, those mini air conditioners. Yeah. I bought three of those. <laughs> they're tiny. Yeah, let me know how they do. Well, I don't know. We we tried them in the war room the other day, and I didn't get a lot of not cool air out of them. <laughs> not too impressed. Sony has come up with this. Oh, I, I can't remember the term they use, but it's some type of it's some type of principle of electricity coursing like over your skin that produces a cooling effect. It'll it's a like I I think it's some kind of like a skin suit or something that you put hmm. on, and it's supposed to drop your 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 outer temperature by 15 degrees. Really? Yeah. And Pretty it's, cool. It's not available in the U.S. because I was I was looking into it. It's hmm. not available in the U.S. yet, but I think if it takes off over in Japan and in Europe, I think they may bring it to the U.S. It won't be long till some hopefully uh, Nomad <laughs> puts it in their line then. That's usually what you see, some new technology come over, and then all the companies will 
figure a way to put if it, it in works, the apparel if it yeah, works. It'll yeah. get widely adopted. Yeah. But it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, the, the, the other thing I do is I will take breaks as I walk to this. Usually the places I'm walking, I've got my climber on my back and I'm going to a, a decent You're distance. really sweating then. Yeah. Sure. And so I'll, I'll take breaks. And and that actually helps me as I'm traveling through the woods because I sound less like a person. And what more time do like, you start? Noon? Or? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I got eight miles to cover, so two miles an hour. But but yeah, you you take breaks and that keeps you from overheating as you get there. But there's and there's just no substitute for hunting the right wind if you can. Yeah, I know. I know Scott's thing was that you got shifting winds and that that's hard. Um, but there's just never a substitute for that. Yeah. Well, so what else you got? Guys, that's all I got. We had EHD. We talked about not alien in depth, ab- but alien abductions. Alien abductions. It's a pretty and- standard show. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so outlook. EHD. Just circling back. Outlook for the season. What's your prediction? You know, obviously we might be in for a tough season, but what what kind of prediction you have for your own personal season? Well, the, you know, up there I had seven or eight shooters coming back. You know, we had a pretty good shed year, and it's taken a while. You know, 12 and 13 were rough where we lost a lot of big deer. So we were finally – what I felt like we were getting back to years where we had some pretty good mm-hmm. seasons. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this could take a real big divot out of it. So, you know, will we have one? Will we have two? You know, I just told Forrest, I said, the moment we get a shooter on camera, shoot I'm going to move in on him, triangulate, and I'll hunt those spots immediate to that area right away. Uh, because they could, you could have them on camera one day, and they could be expired the next, sadly mm-hmm. enough, you know. Let me ask you, so for hunters out there, because my wife asked me this question. She's like, what about the meat? How do you know, like, is is there should you eat it should you not eat it i know I, that there's not supposed to be some sort of you know transmission, transmission but still what you know mm-hmm. what do they recommend there the conservation department i don't know so i just saw someone ask that same question online here in the past few days and i don't know i mean because that that ehd the ehd buck that jason cooper posted that we ran on the show a couple weeks back with mark yeah it looked just to look at it it looked it beautiful looked, looked healthy looked yeah, healthy it did and then it literally probably was dead within how many it hours? Dr- drowned that? itself. Did it drown itself? A lot of people yeah. online said that was a hoax video. Oh, I'm sure they did. <laughs> That's everything's a hoax online. But that that wasn't. And we know it, the it, guy that yeah he's he's, he's, he's a yeah. serious guy, incredible and, guy. Yeah, he comes from a good family. It drowned. In answer to your question, though, we uh, you know I don't know that there's a, a right or wrong there. You know, yeah. you're a little apprehensive, obviously, because you don't know if the deer is infected with EHD. They say that it doesn't, you know, affect humans. But you're a little bit leery. I, you know, I would, my personal opinion, I would have a tendency to, to maybe wait till November or December when we start getting into those colder, colder temperatures and they look healthy, got a full coat. Yeah. You know, when the midge has, has subsided and they're no longer biting mm-hmm. them anymore, I would have a tendency to lean. If you were going to fill the freezer and put one or two in the freezer, I would probably this year maybe have a tendency to wait a little bit. Here's an ethical question for you. If you saw a buck like was in the video, a good shooter buck that you believed had EHD, it walked past your stand, would you shoot it? I'd say yes. I, I would to take it out of its misery. Yes, absolutely. That would be a mercy, you know, act. And I would if, think. And what if it weren't a shooter buck? That's the more. That's the harder question. I burnt a tag one year with the dogs. You know, they ran a, a deer that was almost on its last breath into my pond, and I burnt a tag and harvested mm. the animal. You know, the deer. Yeah. For all you, <laughs> it's been, it's the you deer to clarify. <laughs> yes, it was. The, but the dogs show. ran the deer into the pond. <laughs> yeah, you know, they had the deer at bay, and we got and, footage of it. Oh you know, yeah, yeah, we aired it. It was, it was, you know, really ruthless. It was a bad, bad scene, and. You know, to your point, would you shoot it or would you not? I think I think the right thing to do is is to go ahead and harvest the animal. Yeah, yeah. burn the tag. Agreed. That, that's a hard one, but I yeah. think that is the right move. Great. Well, speaking of right moves, why don't we shut this thing down? <laughs> <laughs> Best thing you said all day. Yes. That. Yeah. I, every now and again, I have a gem. Uh, thank you to Scott for the question. We appreciate that. If you want to submit a question to the show, go ahead and go to the DreOutdoors.com website, go to Extras, Podcast, click the send voicemail message and uh, keep it short. Give us your name, location, and what your question is. And as always, we are giving away a farm. What? 60 acres. 
northern Missouri. So all you got to do is head to the DeerCast.com uh, or DeerCast app on your phone, and it's in the lower right-hand side. It says Farm Giveaway. You click it, you enter in your name, your email address, and you're automatically entered in for a chance to win a 60-acre farm that's Fully set up, ready to hunt. If I might add one thing, we went in and burnt it off maybe with chemicals probably, I want to say maybe a month ago, then went in and planted it, got some timely rains Looks with good. biologic maximum, winter bulb sugar beets, radishes, and they are literally blowing out of the ground. It, those food plots look really good on a giveaway farm. They do. Got the pond stocked. We, you know, we had the timber assessed for evaluation, and that farm is, is really set up right and ready to rock. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get those pictures from you and add it to the video yeah, version great. of the podcast. So Perfect. We can show people what it's doing. It's pretty cool, and and that's just the at the year at the end of the year. So currently, every month, I think this podcast will be up in a day or two, and so we're giving away Winchester, a Winchester, Winchester firearms package. Correct? Yeah, yeah, an SXP twenty gauge turkey shotgun, uh, one of their XPR rifles, and the six point five Creed more. And then, if that weren't enough. 350 bones to spend at winchester.com. Uh, Sweet. So, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. You sign up once and you're signed up for all of it. And dear Lord, only sign up once. Yes. <laughs> if you <laughs> Otherwise, it, won't, it actually won't let it you. It won't let you. And everyone says, the thing isn't working. I can't. Yeah. And it, you, it's because you've already signed up. Yep. You're so, good. anyways... The app is rocking and rolling. We got a lot of people in there, and the DeerCast track is already helping people recover their deer. The new the new tool inside DeerCast. So by all means, check it out, and uh, I think you're gonna enjoy it. Yeah, let's say goodbye. All righty, good Until stuff, next guys. Time, See safe ya. hunting. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV is brought to you by Onyx Hunt, the nation's number one GPS hunting app. 